It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Welcome to Kingdom Theology. I hope you're blessed in the Lord. In this video, we want to look at one of my old videos. It was actually an interview I did with uh, Pastor Rory Butler, one of my good friends in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. He is pastor of New Life Christian Church. And we wanted to look at it. It's about the Hebraic Roots Movement. It kind of gives an overview of some of the dangers of the Hebraic Roots Movement. And I've done other videos on this topic, but I, I wanted to touch on this one because it was quite a uh, spot on video and I want to add a couple things as we go along the way and hope that this helps you. The Hebraic Roots Movement ha has to do with the idea that everything we read in the New Testament has Hebraic roots. In other words, it goes back to Hebrew thought, Hebrew culture, because it comes out of the Old Testament, which uh, it has some, some real validity to it because Jesus was uh, a Hebrew. He was from the Hebraic people uh, and the Old Testament was, of course, among the Hebrews. And so there, there's a lot of truth that we need to understand the thinking of the Old Testament in order to comprehend the, the, the teaching of the New Testament. But the problem is, is that the New Testament is a revelation given how to understand the Old Testament. So I wasn't kidding when I said it was an old video. It was almost 10 years ago, so you can see I didn't even have any gray in my goatee yet. But this point that I was making about looking at the Old Testament through the New Testament is an important key to understanding scripture overall. Uh, you know, a lot of people will have a lot of different systems that try to understand the scripture. Some will, like the Hebraic roots, they'll say we understand the New Testament by looking through the Torah, or they understand all the scripture by the foundation of Torah. Others will say, no, it's through dispensations. We need to understand the concept of dispensations, and then we look through scripture through that lens. Others will say, no, there's a covenant of law and a covenant of grace, and we need to look through those to be able to understand all of Scripture. But the biblical teaching is that we look through Jesus Christ as revealed in the New Testament by apostolic revelation. And when we do that, we come to the Old Testament and we understand the fulfillment. This is key to all biblical interpretation. We start with the New Testament. We start with the revelation of Jesus Christ, particularly in the Gospels. And then through the epistles, we are able to see and understand the teaching of the apostles that they received by revelation through Jesus Christ. Then we go back and we're under, able to understand what God was trying to communicate through the Old Testament types and shadows. In other words, if we go to Luke chapter 24, we read that the revelation that was given to the apostles after Jesus was risen from the dead in verse 44, Luke 24, verse 44, said, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and, he, and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So the Hebraic roots idea is that we have to think from the Old Testament perspective and come and then through the Old Testament, we interpret the New Testament. 
And what ends up being from that is a lot of people uh, start, they start doing the feast to try to keep the different feast of the Old Testament to try to remember Christ. Uh, this is one level of things. They'll do the Passover, even though the book of uh, Numbers or maybe in Leviticus, it tells us the Passover can only be celebrated in Jerusalem, but they'll celebrate this as a memory just to, just to reflect, you know, on, on the truths that it teaches. Uh, other people will go further and say that we need to obey the dietary laws because nothing could cancel that out. Uh, people go even as far as saying that uh, it can go so far that people even deny the deity of Christ, the pre-existence of Christ, because they say that he's just the law fulfilled in flesh, not, not the word of God, the eternal word of God, but the law in flesh. So there's a lot of different levels of this Hebraic roots. Some seem very in innocent and some can be very innocent. We're just doing out a devotional, doing a Passover feast to be able to remember all the things that it points to Christ. But others become much more in-depth and become much more a lifestyle when people start saying that Christians are still obligated and supposed to obey these things. They'll usually have a way of saying it. They'll say, oh yeah, but it doesn't get you saved, but it, you, know, but it, you still need to keep it as fruit of your salvation. And this is, becomes a very dangerous thing. If I really had to nail down when it is that somebody crosses that line, the, the line from believing something that's off, believing something unbiblical, to where they're in great danger, where they have uh, crossed the line, where they're, they are beginning to leave Jesus Christ himself and the salvation that is found in him. I would make the line in, the, in regards to the Hebraic Roots Movement, it would be when we no longer consider fellowship in Jesus Christ. What I mean is that whenever people start to say that if you keep the Torah, you are my brother. If you uh, you know, some people will say, well, as long as you believe in Jesus and you keep the Torah, you're my brother. And if not, if you practice Christmas, if you uh, practice Easter, if you don't keep the Shabbat, if you don't keep these things, then you're not my brother. You're not really following Jesus because you're not keeping the Torah. That is to replace Jesus Christ with the Torah. Instead of him being the cornerstone through which we fellowship and we have fellowship in his body, it becomes something else. It becomes the Torah and we replace it. Uh, this happens in many different sects, wh whether it be Jehovah's Witness, uh, Mormonism, where they will say that, no, if you're not in our church, if you don't belong to our group, then you are outside. That makes the organization that they belong to, for example, the Watchtower Society and Jehovah's Witness, if you don't follow and obey that organization, then you're cut off from uh, the body. You're no longer part of the Christian church. You're no longer part of God's people and you're out of salvation. When somebody does that, they have replaced Jesus Christ with something else. And in the, the Hebraic Roots Movement, when somebody goes so far where they say, no, unless somebody keeps the Torah, they, I cannot have fellowship with them. They are not Christian. They are not truly following Jesus Christ and they are not saved. When they cross that line, they have stepped in and they have turned away from Christ and they've turned to something else. Uh, here we understand whenever Jesus was revealing the Old Testament, it says that he was revealing the he was revealing Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he told them what was in it, which is namely in the law is written about the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, uh, and the preaching of the gospel to all nations. When we go read the, the law, we wouldn't read that. We would read that, and if we read it in context, in the Old Testament context, we would read it and we wouldn't hear anything about the Christ died, risen from the dead, the gospel preached to Gentiles. Because the way God, uh, the way Christ opened their minds to understand it was the deeper meaning of the law. Not just the letter of the law, not just the historical context of the law, but the actual fulfillment of the law. All the law was just a picture of what Christ was going to be. It was, a, it was only pointing to Christ. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 5 to the Pharisees, he told them, look, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life, but they testify about me, but you refuse to come to me so that you can have life. So we have to understand also in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says that when people read the Old Testament law before they come to Christ, there's a veil over them because they're only reading according to the letter. But whenever somebody turns to the Lord, then their eyes are open and they see the glory of Christ in the law. So we have to understand that we're not rationalists that go to the Old Testament and try to read it only in its historical context. No, we read it from the revelation that was given to the apostles by Jesus Christ himself. That they had their eyes, their spiritual eyes were opened to understand the mystery of Christ. Things that were hidden in the past were open to them. They understood what the meaning of the law and the prophets 
and the Psalms were so that they could explain that. That's why we have the New Testament. We don't interpret the New Testament through the Old Testament. We interpret the Old Testament through the New Testament, through the apostolic teaching. Whenever the church was formed in Acts chapter 2, uh, it, it says that they, they were daily eating bread together, going from house to house, fellowshipping, worshiping God, praying, and listening to the teaching of the apostles. Because the teaching of the apostles was by revelation, not, by, uh, not merely by going back and studying the context of things. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when the apostles quote the Old Testament scripture, in fact, a lot of times when they quote the Old Testament scripture, they quote it completely out of context, sometimes completely disregarding or in opposite opposition to the context. Uh, we can. The reason is because they received revelation. They received divine revelation from Jesus Christ about the meaning and the purpose of the Old Testament, which were only types and shadows. We can look at a couple examples. If we go to Matthew chapter... 2 and we look here at verse 15 this is speaking of jesus after he came back out of egypt he, he ran there because of herod and the, his his parents brought him back verse starting verse 14 when he rose he took a young child and his mother by night and departed into egypt and remained there until the death of herod to fulfill what the lord had spoken through the prophet out of egypt I have called my son. Now that's quoted from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. And it's talking about whenever God brought Israel out of Egypt. When he delivered them from slavery in Egypt, he said, out of Egypt, I have called my son. But here, Matthew applies this to Jesus Christ because that Israel coming out of Egypt was only a type and a shadow of the true fulfillment, which is in Jesus Christ. We see another here in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, let's look at verse, okay, verse uh, 25. Oh, let's start in verse 24. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So he's going to speak and he quote about the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. So here he's quoting from Hosea and saying there was a quotation that these were not my people, but now they are my people. I didn't know them, but now they're my sons. That was actually, if we go back to the context, that was speaking about Israel. When God judged Israel, he said, I don't know you. And then he was promising that there was going to be a time when he would welcome them back. But here, Paul is saying that this is actually applicable to the Gentiles who now were not God's people, who did not know God, but now have become the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So we, you have to ask, well, were they just abusing the scriptures? No, they were giving us the understanding of the revelation of what was revealed in the Old Testament, what was kept hidden until uh, the revelation of the mystery was given to the apostles, both in Luke chapter 24, and then we see it was also given to Apostle Paul, who says he was born out of season. In Ephesians chapter 3, it was also given to him that he would understand that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs and members of the house of God in Israel. And so we need to understand that they weren't just taking things out of context, they were giving us revelation. This is why we start in the New Testament to understand the Old Testament because it's through apostolic revelation given through Jesus Christ, God's only son. So the Hebraic roots movement, the danger of it is that we go back under Judaism. We go back under Judaism, not just in the sense that, oh, everybody's saying now you've gotta, you can only go to heaven if you obey the law. Very few of them will say that because everything always has to be a little bit tweaked. That's how, that's how errors creep into the church is because they take something, twist it just a little bit and they qualify it and they say it's okay because of this and it's not that. And so uh, that's not what we do. We don't go back under the law. We don't have to walk under the law. We only walk under the fulfilled uh, thing which is in Jesus Christ. And so we have to keep in mind what, uh, what Colossians and Ephesians tells us that all the wisdom of God is in Christ Jesus. That all the revelation that God has given points to him and is about him. He is the revelation and so we have to understand that it's not just going back and following the letter of the law. So what do you think then if somebody is saying, well, uh, I believe that the Christians now should keep uh, the dietary laws, not eat pork, um, and, and certain things like that, and they're saying, they don't say that you must do it to be saved, but just as a memorial, it's, it's a good thing for Christians to do it. Do you think it's a good thing for Gentile Christians now to begin to put themselves under these Old Testament stipulations? Uh, of course not. Paul said that that's another gospel. 
In Galatians, he, whenever he refers in, in the book of Galatians chapter 1, and he says, look, if anybody comes and preaches you another gospel than the one you received, let him be accursed. And so, and the gospel that they were preaching was, comes from Acts chapter 15. In another video, we'll get into that. But in Acts chapter 15, there were Pharisees that had come to Christ and they were saying, look, you, the Gentiles need to be required to be circumcised and to obey the law of Moses. And so these Christians were coming and saying, now you Gentiles need to do these things as a sign that you're part of God's people. They weren't saying that if you do it enough and you'll earn enough favor with God and then you'll be forgiven and justified. No, they were saying that now that you've come to God, you've returned to God, in order to be part of God's people, then you need to keep these things because this is the covenant that God made with his people. This is how to be part of the chosen people of God is to keep these laws. These are the sign that you're part of God's people, that you're keeping these things. So Paul was very adamant in saying, if anybody preaches anything like that to you, let him be accursed. Now, some people nowadays are, you know, they're, they're hearing, oh, keeping the fees, I want to keep the fees so that I can remember things, or I want to keep the dietary law because it's good for health. That's fine. It's fine as long as they know that there's absolutely nothing in the Bible that says that they need to keep the fees or that they need to, uh, they need to keep those dietary laws. If they want to just take that and say that's just a practice that they have, it's a personal practice, or even it's a group of people that want to do that together and they want to do that in order to meditate on the things of Christ, that's totally acceptable. But the moment they start saying that this is what Christianity teaches, or this is still something obligated, even if it doesn't get them salvation, but it's something that we still need to do, then that becomes the heresy Paul is talking about. And heresy goes beyond error. It's about man just twisting things and misunderstanding. It goes to a place where it can lead us away from salvation in Christ. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are revealed, which are these, adultery, sexual immorality, impurity, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, rage, selfishness, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I previously warned you, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So this is an important list. And in the midst of this list, it names two things, heresies and dissensions. And these two things are very closely related. Now, what is a heretic in the, the capital H type sense? What is, what is someone that is a heretic uh, that they are not going to inherit the kingdom of God? They are walking according to flesh. It's men who come to the scriptures and they invent and create new things that were not in the scriptures that are contrary to the teaching of the scriptures and to Orthodox Christianity. When people come to those things and do that, they are acting in the flesh. Because what are they doing? They're creating something new. They're leaning on their own understanding. They're not submitting to the scripture, but they're letting the scripture submit to their own understanding. And they're creating heresies. They're walking the flesh. And then they're doing this often with the goal of bringing people after them. As Paul says in Acts chapter 20, he said that the elders, that after he left, he knew that even among the own men, the elders were going to draw away disciples after themselves. They were going to become wolves seeking to make disciples for themselves. And so people will do this. They make dissensions by saying, I've got this new invented heresy, this new idea, this new concept. Come and follow me. Now, I want to explain this because there's a distinction between somebody that has listened to the, these teachers of the Hebraic Roots Movement have accepted the ideas and said, yeah, they can't get around it. There's scriptures that seem to line up with that. And they embrace this system, but they embrace it to a degree that they, they say this, as believers in Christ, with the Spirit of God, they say, you know, I, I can't get around this. This looks like the, what the scriptures are saying. These guys really know their stuff. They really know the Old Testament, the New Testament. All the scriptures seem to line up. And so I, my conscience is now listening to what they're saying. But in the, their heart, they still recognize, but... There's other believers out there that don't understand this, that aren't following, you know, all the laws of Torah, but that are just following after Jesus Christ and simply loving God and loving their neighbor. And I don't reject them as my brothers in Christ. And even though my conscience says I must keep Shabbat, I can't eat, un, you know, I can't eat uh, unkosher food, you know, all these things. And, and they, they take it in their conscience and they feel like, man, I've, I've got to do this this way. But they still hold the line and say, but... That doesn't mean I enforce it on others. In Romans chapter 14, it talks about this, that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
And so there are some that are in the Hebraic Roots movement that they don't go into dissension, they don't separate themselves from other believers, and they don't become heretics in the sense that they're saying, my truth is the truth, my stronghold, the ideas that I believe that are lifted up above the knowledge of God, I bow to those and I worship those and I won't follow after anything else. I won't follow after the living God, I'll follow after this doctrine, this teaching. They don't go that far, it affects their conscience, they, they look at the scripture, they can't get it, they're stuck in it, but they don't become divisive because of it. And they don't enforce it on other people. And so I want us to see that there is a, a clarification between people that have fallen into the Hebraic Roots movement and those heretics that are able to go to scripture and find all kinds of interesting two-house theology and they're able to knit this together with that and do all these kind of things and they never doubt themselves. They always trust themselves. But these simple disciples that are uh, deceived by these men, oftentimes they will have a humble heart and they'll say, well, I just can't see it any other way. But other people who don't keep Torah, they're still my brothers in Christ. So what do you say uh, about people that are saying, well, there's been things that have, uh, we've missed uh, and that were there maybe during the early church. Uh, maybe they were keeping the laws and maybe they were worshiping on uh, Saturday instead of Sunday and things like that. And so now we need to go back to recover those things. And maybe nowadays, uh, we've just missed those things. Uh, the early church is Paul, the apostles. So we go to the book of Acts chapter 15. We go to uh, Galatians, Romans, uh, uh, Philippians. We read these and we read their teaching and their teaching is saying, no, Christians don't have to do that. That's why Paul says in Colossians, let no one judge you according to Sabbaths, new moons, festivals. Don't let anybody say, do not eat this, do not taste this, do not touch this, you know, because all those things uh, perish with the using of them. And so uh, whenever somebody, uh, somebody says that that's the things that we, we're going to go back and do those things, that doesn't have anything to do with us anymore. So the New Testament, after the, the, the apostles, the early church after them, the apostolic fathers and those, they were very adamant that Gentiles should not do this. They taught very clearly that we do not worship on Saturday. Our, our Sabbath is no longer worshiping on Saturday. It's no longer stopping work. But our, what we now, on the first day of the week, in order to, in remembrance and celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we worship God on the first day of the week because that's the new creation in Christ. Just the first day was the day when God created the heavens and the earth and he begins to create and then the very last day the seventh day was the Sabbath when God rested from all his works and in the Old Testament God gave them the Sabbath so that they could remember that God was their creator they could remember that the one that they're following is the creator of heaven and earth the one that made the earth in seven days and so every time they rested on the Sabbath they were remembering that God created everything they were the followers of the creator well in the new covenant the what we're, we're taught to do is to celebrate the Lord's Day and the Lord's Day is the new creation because you had the seven days are fulfilled and then on the eighth day the early church called it the eighth day which was also in the in the law that during a day of circumcision when you circumcise a child on the eighth day when you made them clean and it was all called the eighth day it was called the the, uh, the, the, the first day or the new creation because in Christ where all things have passed away and all things have become new. That's why he's recreated everything and we celebrate not, no longer do we celebrate the Sabbath, we celebrate the Lord's day. It's okay if somebody wants to rest on, on the seventh day, that's fine for them to do as long as they understand that that's not what is scriptural. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what uh, the fulfillment of the law is. The fulfillment of the law is that Christ is our Sabbath that he's the one that has brought us into the true rest the new creation, just like Noah brought us out of the uh, brought the uh, brought the animals and his family out of the old world into a new world. After baptism, we're brought into a new world. The same way, uh, you know, as as is the uh, Egyptians enslaved the Israelites and they were stuck in the old slavery system. They came through the waters of baptism through the Nile or the through the the Red uh, Red Sea, and they came into a new world with a new system with new laws. And under the new covenant, we have a new high priest. We have and a, a Hebrew says that if there's a new high priest then there's obviously a change of law and so we're no longer under the law of Moses but we're under the law of Christ as it says in uh, several places in the New Testament let me share a few quotes from the early church writers to make my point stronger here uh, writing in 105 AD Ignatius one of the disciples I believe of John the Apostle says no longer observing the Sabbath but living in accordance in the observance of the Lord's Day that was Ignatius uh, let's see here. We've got another one from, this is about Sabbath. Uh, this is going to be, I believe, 
I think we wrote Justin Martyr. Is there any other matter, my Jewish friends, in which we, are, we Christians are blamed than this, that we do not live after the law and do not observe the Sabbaths as you do? This is Justin Martyr in 160 AD. Okay, so we have a disciple of the, uh, of the Apostle John. Uh, we have Justin Martyr, even in his name, we understand that he went to death for Christ. Uh, here's another from Justin Martyr. You, a Jew, now have need of second circumcision. Although you glory greatly in the flesh, the new law requires you to keep a perpetual Sabbath. However, you, because you are idle for one day, suppose you are godly. The Lord our God does not take pleasure in such observances. If there is any perjured person, in other words, a liar, or a thief among you, let him cease to be so. Then he has kept the sweet and true Sabbaths of God. Again, that was Justin Martyr. So he's saying that the true Sabbath is that we rest from our wicked works and we begin to serve God in righteousness. Uh, here's another. There was no need of circumcision before Abraham, nor was there need of the observance of Sabbaths or of feasts and sacrifices before Moses. Accordingly, there is no more need of them now. Again, Justin Martyr. If some through weak mindedness, now this is going to go with the point that I, I, I made in the, the last clip that I, I clipped in, that there are some people that because they hear the teaching from those in the Hebraic Roots Movement, they think that it is true, and so their conscience is bound by it, and they begin to observe things. And he makes the same point here. This is again going to be Justin Martyr. If some, through weak-mindedness, wish to observe the laws given by Moses, yet choose to live with the Christians and the faithful, as I said before, not inducing the Gentiles either to be circumcised like themselves or to keep the Sabbath or to observe any other such ceremonies, then I hold that we should join ourselves with such person. Justin Marty, Martyr 160 AD. So he's saying that if people fall into this error of keeping the Sabbath and they feel they need to do it, but they don't enforce it on other Christians, but they live faithfully in fellowship with believers, then we should fellowship with them as our brothers in Christ. Okay, here's another from Ignatius. If we still live according to the Jewish law, we acknowledge that we have not received grace. Ignatius 105 AD. We do not follow the Jews in their peculiarities in regard to food, nor in their sacred days, nor even in their well-known bodily sign, referencing circumcision. This is Tertullian in 197 AD. Going on again, Paul blames the Galatians, so he's going to tell us what Galatians was about. Paul blames the Galatians for maintaining circumcision and observing times, months, and years according to those Jewish ceremonies. For they should have known those things were now abrogated according to the new dispensation. Thus it was said by Hosea, I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths. The Creator had long before discarded all these things, and the Apostle was now proclaiming them to be worthy of renunciation. Tertullian, 207 A.D. Tertullian again, At the very outset, outset of his ministry, he came not to destroy the law and the prophets, but rather to fulfill them. His word was with power. However, this was not because he taught in opposition to the law and the prophets. Tertullian, 277 AD. So in one quote, he's saying that these old things have been abrogated. But here he's saying that they've been fulfilled because the teaching of the early church and the teaching of the New Testament is that in Jesus Christ, in his word, that's why he says his word was with power, that he was the one speaking with authority. When he sat on the mount and he gave his sermon on the mount, he was speaking with authority. He said, you've heard it said in the Old Testament, but I say to you, and his words, his commands fulfill the righteous requirements of the Old Testament. So we no longer keep the outward ceremony, Sabbaths and new moons and festivals and, and the, the dietary laws because those things were only a shadow and type pointing to Christ. But we do keep the righteousness of the law, which is to love God and to love your neighbor. This is why in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus says, So if you, you do unto others as you have them do unto you, this is the law and the prophets. That's how he fulfills them with his teaching. Tertullian clarifies further, We do not now deal with the law any further than to remark that the apostle here teaches clearly how it has been abolished by passing from shadow to substance. That is, it has passed from figurative types to the reality which is Christ. Tertullian, 207 A.D.
Okay, so give me a worst case scenario. Maybe you've personally seen people that have gone down this path. Um, what's a worst case scenario? What's the uh, the worst thing that could happen if somebody gets into this stuff? And I, I, let me give three levels. The first, the first, when somebody gets into this, they uh, it's just a matter of keeping the fees or doing the dietary laws, and they kind of feel. You know, either they got two, it depends on their attitude. Either they're feeling, uh, you know, oh, this is good, this just helps me. I understand it's nothing that I have to do in the Bible, but it, it helps me meditate on Christ. Other people that even at that low level of doing things, they start getting an attitude of like, oh yeah, why are these people, wow, why don't they celebrate the feast? Why are they keeping Christmas? Why are they doing this? They start getting an attitude that starts making them separate themselves and divide themselves. The second level are those that start theologically understanding and saying, wait a second, Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so that means we're not supposed to get rid of the Old Testament. We're supposed to start doing it. And so then they'll pick and choose some things. They'll, they'll never say, we, you know, very rarely will they say, oh, I got to keep the sacrifices and do this. And they'll say some things are fulfilled and they'll say other things that we still have to submit to. And once they get to that point, then they very often will uh, usually look at other believers and say they're totally off. They've totally strayed from the Bible and they'll start getting a very critical attitude. And usually at this point is when they separate themselves from the brethren, they separate themselves from their church and leave. The third level is those that are trying to be totally consistent with the fact. And they say, look, Jesus said not one iota, not one dot or one tittle of the law will be will pass away until heaven or then. So they say, we've got to keep the whole thing, even the sacrifices, the feasts, the law, even the stoning your children when they rebel. And it gets to a point. And so I have some people that I know that they go to that extreme. They say, well, we can't keep the sacrifice right now because there's no temple, but when there's a temple, we have to do it. They say, yes, of course, we should still stone our rebellious son if you know, and bring him to the gates of the city. And they, 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 they're very consistent. And these same people that have gone to this extreme understand that in the beginning, it says in, in John chapter one, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And they, and they goes on and of course it talks about Jesus Christ and it says, and the word became flesh. And they've already shifted and say, look, Coming from Hebraic roots, there's no way you can say that God has a son. There's no understanding, no concept to say that God has an eternal son. And so when it's talking about the word in a Hebraic root sense, the word must be talking about the Torah, about the law. So it says in the beginning was the Torah and the Torah was with God and the Torah was God. And the Torah became flesh. Well, how did the Torah became flesh? Because Jesus completely obeyed the Torah. And so he manifests what it's like to live out the Torah. And so they get to the point where they deny the deity of Christ. They deny the, uh, the, the pre-existence of Christ. And they say that Jesus was only a commentator on the law of Moses and teaching the law of Moses. Wow. So at that point, then they're no longer even Christians anymore. Yeah, I would say at the second level, they're already no longer Christians so anymore. So they're already uh, apostatized. They're already apostatized. They've already left the faith. Yeah, in, in 1 John, it says one of the important things about knowing that you're part of the Christians is that you love the believers. But when people start saying, my truth that I've got makes me want to separate from my leadership, makes me want to separate from the fellowship with the church, then that already means that that, that seed uh, of heresy has got them to a place where they're, they're separating themselves, where the, 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 the wolves are taking them out away from the flock so that they can be destroyed. So it's a slippery slope. When somebody gets to the point where they've totally apostatized, definitely if they get to the point where they deny Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God, definitely if they get to the point where they're saying that every Christian has to keep the law of Moses, definitely they've already done that. Along that pathway, along the, but it's a slippery slope and you know God knows when they've really crossed that line. Again, just let me note that not everyone who believes something false is a heretic walking according to the flesh, but those that enforce it on others that separate themselves from the believers and say, no, you have to keep the law of Moses to be saved. They are no longer fellowshipping in Christ. They are fellowshipping in the Torah. There's no salvation through Torah, only through Jesus Christ. And so, and then so what advice would you give to people who are dealing with this sort of thing coming into their churches? Or, I mean, there's a lot of this stuff on the internet. There's a lot of books out there. Uh, what advice would you give to like pastors or leaders to, in dealing with this? Yeah, so the, the pastors in particular need to, to read up. They need to understand where the Hebraic Roots people are coming from so that they can win whenever. See, here's what happens. If somebody starts reading these things about Hebraic Roots, they start getting into this and they get the mindset of the Hebraic Roots, and then they come to the pastor and they start saying these strange things, and the pastor doesn't know anything about them and starts answering and saying, no, this is wrong, this is this is wrong. But then the person is thinking, yeah, but you're not even answering the questions I'm asking. You don't even understand what I'm talking about. So you're speaking out of ignorance, so you're not convincing me that the things I'm hearing is wrong. 
So as pastors, I said we need to study to show ourselves approved. We need to understand what our sheep are hearing so that we can understand and give them a real answer for the things that they're hearing. So when they come and say, look, I've heard this, we can say, yeah, I know that, that line of thinking and here's what the Bible says about it and here's how we deal with it. So we can't just, when it comes in, just ignorantly, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. We do that, that will, that will, that will, uh, it, it will give, it will bring them to a place where they definitely know that, oh, okay, my pastor doesn't know what he's talking about, these people must be right. We need to learn these things so that we can protect the flock. So ignorance is danger. Ignorance is not bliss. One of the things that leads people into heresy and causes them to walk away from the body of Christ, to walk away from fellowship with true believers and into some heresy and into dissension is that many pastors rely on an argument from authority. In other words, somebody comes to them and they know these disciples, so they know that they're, they've got rough edges, and they come to them and they say, hey, why do we keep Christmas? I, I heard on the internet that that's pagan and that the tree is the Druids, and by, besides, why are we saying Jesus? It should be Yeshua, and they start saying these things. And then the pastor, one, because they're a little frustrated with the disciple who's so rough around the edges, but then two, because they, they take offense that they're being challenged. They don't answer carefully, they don't say, well, okay, well, explain to me everything that you're saying. What are the videos that you watch? Let me watch them with you. Let me go back and study these things. Give me a little bit of time to, you know, this week I'm just going to read a lot of books. I'm going to focus on this issue and try to understand where this is all coming from, where you're getting these ideas, or what, what this is coming from so that I can understand you and help you walk through this. And so instead what they say is, look, Submit. The Bible says submit to your leaders. I'm telling you that's wrong. No, we've always done Christmas. It's fine. It doesn't have anything to do with Druids. We're not worshiping the tree. You know, just, just get out of my office and you know you need to do right and submit to me. And by the way, have you paid your tithe? You know, and these things, uh, you know, this is often what pushes people away from orthodoxy. And by that, I mean the, the Christian church, whatever denomination it is, but that are truly following Jesus Christ that pushes them away into the arms of, you know, heretical movements like, uh, you know, the Hebraic Roots movement, because they don't get honest answers. They don't get informed answers from their leadership, but instead they just get, you know, answers from authority, you know, submit to me, I'm the leader, that's it, deal with it. And that does not work. I hope this has been uh, helpful to you. I hope looking at this old video and kind of my new um, thoughts on the issue have been helpful to you. Uh, if it has been helpful to you, go ahead and like and subscribe and share and all that stuff to help the algorithm push this video out so other people can be helped by it. And I just uh, hope that you're blessed in the Lord. God bless.